Where lies the king? Five is up. Sergeant, would you start your recording? PC recording good. Cloud is rolling. Backup is rolling. Thank you, Sergeant Lugo, you may begin. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Governmental Operations. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Cabrera, we are ready to begin. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning. I am Council Member Fernando Cabrera, Chair to the Committee on Governmental Operations. I want to start off by thanking the members of the committee joining us today. Council Members Powers, Council Member Yeager, Council Member Parkins. Uh, that's all I see right now. Uh, today, the committee will hear a piece of legislation regarding the authority to issue press credentials to members of the media in New York City. These credentials allow journalists to cross police and fire lines and attend city-sponsored events that are open to the press, subject to safety concerns, the preservation of evidence, and space limitation. Introduction number 2118, sponsored by Councilmember Powers will give the commissioner of the Department of City Y Administrative Services, DCAS, sole authority to issue, suspend, and revoke credential, press credentials. Right now, the NYPD hold this authority. The bill will require DCAS to promulgate rules that establish procedures, criteria, and criteria for issuing, suspending, and revoking press credentials, and the process for appealing any decision to suspend or revoke. Credentials will only be issued to individuals who have passed a background check. We must ensure that journalists have a clear and fair process for applying for press credentials and for appealing decisions to suspend or revoke them. I think it is especially important that journalists have an opportunity to appeal to a neutral adjudicating agency outside of one issue in the credentials, such as office or administrative trials and hearings. I'd like to explore the possibility of using oath as an agency with a strong track record of adjudicating disputes or appeals. With that, I want to thank the NYPD and the administration for being here today. I look forward to their testimony. I also want to thank our committee staff, CJ Murray, Emily Forjohn, Elizabeth Kwan, Sebastian Bacci, and the central staff for operating this remote hearing behind the scenes. I also want to thank my own legislative director, Claire McLevain, for making this hearing possible. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Councilmember Powell, to say a few words about his bill. Councilmember Powell. Thank you. I was waiting to be unmuted. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. And thank you, everyone who's here today um, to discuss this issue, one that I hold dear, and I know many here do as well. I'm City Council Member Keith Powers. And again, thanks to the Chair Cabrera for giving me the opportunity to say a few words today, but also scheduling this hearing. Um, I introduced this bill with Council Member Adams a few months ago to protect the freedom of the press, which is one of the greatest protections that we offer in this country and in here in New York City we need to make sure that that protection is guaranteed as much as we fight for in other places as well we need to make sure that right here at home we're doing our jobs to protect the press uh, in my view any press credential that's issued by the city should be easy to access easy to qualify and should be free of any political considerations members of the media must be able to report on stories without any concern that their coverage will result in losing a press pass or not being able to obtain one and just even more frankly, we need to make sure that people who are working in these fields, whether as a photographer or as a reporter, feel like this process is easy and does not constrain them in their ability to do their jobs. Um, today, we're going to hear a uh, intro 2118, which is my bill to transfer authority away from the New York Police Department to, uh, the, to the citywide and Department of Citywide Administrative Services as the sole authority to issue, suspend, or revoke press credentials in New York City. 
My legislation ensures that we have a process for distributing press credentials that is fair, equitable, and accessible, and creates a balanced system that protects our free press here in New York City. It's an opportunity to hear ways to change a system so that the process is better streamlined and to minimize conflicts of interest. The diversity and emergence of new press outlets requires a reconsideration of this entire process, and I think that should be an evolving and ongoing conversation always, including who, but that, which includes who issues the press credentials, uh, which this process has been in place for decades, and to provide easy flexibility for agencies to update these regulations and these qualifications over time. A new system will not take and take anything away from the meaning and significance of issued press credentials in my eyes, but we'll make sure that it is viewed as an independent authority and that we can make uh, this process easy and fair. And just as I am talking to this, I have actually a constituent who actually reached out to me about this process, airing some concerns themselves with their ability to get a press, uh, press uh, pass. And, I think even the idea that a number of them have just expired all at the same time, causing further constraints. So I think we have identified a problem. I want to say thank you to all those who have helped us think about how to resolve this and a number of the members of the press corps I see on here today who we've chatted with about their comments on the legislation and tried to work with as well. I want to thank my staff, Sarah Newman, and all the staff and the council for their work on this. And um, I look forward to hearing everybody's testimony here today. So thank you to Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member Powers, and thank you for your leadership. I want to uh, recognize we're being joined by Council Member Kalos and Council Member Rodriguez. And with that, I will now turn it over to our moderator, uh, Committee Council CJ Murray, to go over some of the procedure, procedural items. Thank you, Chair. I am CJ Murray, counsel to the Committee on Governmental Operations. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist to give testimony today will be representatives from the administration, from the NYPD. Testimony will be provided by Executive Agency Counsel Lisa Bland, Managing Attorney for Legislative Affairs, Michael Clark, and Assistant Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters, Oleg Chernyevsky. In addition, from the Mayor's Office of City Legislative Affairs, Director Paul Ochoa will be providing testimony. Panelist, I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if a council member would like to ask a question of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes the panelists to answer your question. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, there will not be a second round of questioning outside of questions from the committee chair. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. Executive Agency Council Bland, Managing Attorney Clark, Assistant Deputy Commissioner Chernyevsky and Director Ochoa, please raise your right hand. I will read the oath once and then call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Executive Agency Council Bland. I do. Managing Attorney Clark. I do. Assistant Deputy Commissioner Chernyevsky. I do. Director Ochoa? I do. Thank you. Executive Agency Council Bland, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cabrera and members of the council. I am Lisa Bland, counsel for the Deputy Commissioner of Public Information. I am joined today by Paul Antonio Ochoa, the Mayor's Director of City Legislative Affairs, Oleg Chernavsky, Assistant Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters of the New York City Police Department, NYPD, and Michael Clark, Managing Attorney of the Legislative Affairs Unit. On behalf of Commissioner Derma Shea, I wish to thank the Council for being the, for the opportunity to discuss this important issue and comment on the bill being heard today. The heart 
of the NYPD's mission is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of those who live in, work in, and visit our city. Yet while protecting the safety of the citizens of this city remains our number one priority, the NYPD currently has a multitude of other functions. One of those functions is the issuance of press credentials. Credentials that enable members of the press to access to newsworthy events so that they may inform the public. The administration unequivocally supports the freedom of the press to do their jobs, reporting on events that take place throughout the city on a daily basis. An informed public on issues ranging from crime to traffic to politics and elections, as well as new city policies and programs, and even trash collection is essential to the functioning of the city. Journalists also play a critical role in holding everyone in government, NYPD included, accountable. When the NYPD and the media intersect, it is the policy of the department to help facilitate the media's ability to fulfill their critical responsibilities. This is represented by a fully staffed 24 seven public information bureau that responds to thousands of media inquiries each year, coordinates and notifies the press regarding NYPD news conferences and other media sessions and enables media access at newsworthy incidents such as crime scenes where safety permits. To facilitate such access, the NYPD has issued press credentials for several decades. The rules for issuance of con and continued maintenance of such credentials have been codified into the rules of the City of New York, RCNY, and are available for public inspection. Pursuant to the RCNY, Press credentials are available to members of the press who cover emergency, spot, or breaking news and or public events of a non-emergency nature. From 2015 to 2020, the NYPD has issued well over 5,000 press cards to members of the press so that journalists can do their jobs. During that five year span, there have been no revocations of press credentials. These numbers illustrate the NYPD's commitment to facilitating the work that journalists do each day to keep the public informed. I would now like to speak about the bill being heard today. Proposed intro number 2118, this bill would give the Department of Citywide Administrative Services DCAS, sole authority to issue, suspend, and revoke press credentials. The administration supports moving press credentialing out of the NYPD, but we believe further conversations are needed to determine the right agency to take on this important work. The department will work with the appropriate agency to ensure a seamless transition. I would be happy to answer any questions you now have. Uh, thank you so much. Let me first uh, recognize we've been joined by council members myself, council member Donna Diaz, council member Adams. Um, let me start by asking uh, Director Ochoa, uh, welcome. Uh, if you could give us any thoughts, uh, as you just mentioned by NYPD, that uh, you have thoughts, they have, there's discussions regarding instead of going to DCAS, which agency would you uh, seem to favor uh, to moving uh, the press credential 
uh, checks and backgrounds. Thank you for your question, council member. Um, happy to be here. Uh, two things, um, I'll start with the right agency. We, we're looking at a couple of agencies. Um, we're looking at citywide event coordination, mayor's office of operations and MOM. Uh, we are leaning towards MOM. Um, they are responsible for movie permitting across the city. They obviously know the media landscape. So um, listen, we still have more conversations but we are leaning towards MOM. On the background checks, I, I'm glad you asked that because we currently do not um, conduct background checks um, as a requirement for press credentials. Um, so it's something that we would love to talk to the council and you all to see if it makes sense to, to have that in the bill. Have you ever had any feedback from the press regarding whether there should be background check or not? No, not that I'm aware. Um, however, again, we are happy to continue those conversations. Okay, great. I'd love to hear from you. We do. I, I would say, though, we do not want to make it harder for people to have access to press credentials. Okay, great. I uh, wanted to know when it comes to appeals, the appeals process, uh, ju uh, adjudicating, I mean, a neutral adjudicating agency, are you amicable to the idea of perhaps having, as I suggested in my opening statement, having an oath? Be in that agency? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I think we agree with you that the appeals process needs to be in a place uh, that's independent. Um, there, as NYPD mentioned, we don't, uh, these don't happen quite often. There was only, I believe, five cases in the last five years, but oath seems like the, the right home for that. Um, however, I do want to make sure that there aren't any uh, legal questions about, about that. Would you be so kind to share with us uh, the breakdown of those five cases? Can you give us a little bit more details? Sure, I will let NYPD answer uh, to, the, to the extent that they can. I'm not sure, I believe there, there may be a couple pending um, cases that are being litigated, but I'll let NYPD handle that. Sure, thank you council member and uh, I wanna congratulate and welcome uh, council member Diaz. I uh, look forward to working with her as well. Um, I think the five cases, uh, one of them is in litigation, so obviously we can't speak to that. Uh, two of the cases were suspensions that the individuals uh, wound up getting their press passes back after the suspension. And uh, two of the suspended uh, passes, the individuals did not appeal and the case effectively, uh, for lack of a better term, died on the vine. So they did not get their press pass back. It wasn't revoked, but they chose not to exercise their rights under the process. Just to be clear, has, has there been any uh, passes revoked, permanently revoked? No, not in the last five years. We didn't look back beyond that, but in the five year look back that we performed to prepare for this hearing, uh, there were no revocations. I have many more questions, but I wanna have the sponsor of the bill, Councilmember Powell, so I know he has questions. And and my colleagues as well. And I'll, and I'll be coming back. Thank you. Um, thank you, the chair. Um, I, I guess this is for uh, uh, from the mayor's office, but I'm happy to hear uh, from anyone here. It, it, is, are there other recommendations? I mean, I, it seems like I've heard frustration from folks around the quality of sort of criteria for getting it, which is submitting, I think, six samples of work. And I have some folks who told me they, uh, you know, found it difficult early on in their career to get the press pass. Some have made, told me frustration with um, just the overall process of having to go down to the one police plaza and things like that. Can you talk to us about any recommendations that you see or any changes to the process in, in, in addition to moving authority to MOM or another, uh, another agency that you see as maybe a, a reasonable adjustment to this process to help facilitate ease in getting a uh, in, in getting a press pass, press credential? I, I can take it and then I'll turn it over to the NYPD. Um, uh, Council Member, that's a great question. I, I have not personally heard of big impediments in uh, accessing a press credential. Um, if that is a problem, we're happy to address it. Uh, I do know that the NYPD uh, just uh, did a, a relook at the process and uh, actually ended up publishing new rules to 
streamline some of that process, but I'll turn it over to Oleg to see if there's, if they've heard any uh, concerns with the ability to get um, press passes. I'll turn it over to uh, Council Bland. Um, I think we, go ahead. The process uh, for getting the press cards is fairly straightforward in terms of it's just filling out an application that's online. It's on the, the NYPD website. You can do a basic Google search for NYPD press cards. Um, in addition, the as far as, far as the um, requirements itself, again, it's just basic requirements that's codified in the rules that's written, written out. And again, it's a simple process in terms of as soon as you send us an application um, by email, which is done by email, uh, those applications are reviewed within two to three days. Um, most are reviewed within 24 hours and in, we'll be scheduling and for you to come down to get your press card. The process itself is very seamless. I mean, that, I mean, I'll just be honest, that differs. I, I'm not saying that you guys are basically the impediment here, but I, it does differ from some of the anecdotes I've heard from folks around, uh, you know, even just the qualification criteria. And we'll, as we're talking about this legislation, I'll share some of those anecdotes with folks so they can take a look at it and we can think together about how to improve any, any you know, hitches in that process. And I think particularly with the advent of new forms of media, perhaps that's a, uh, uh, you know, sort of needed anyway. Um, and, you know, is this process, but I just wanted to ask, is this process online? You, you, did you say you can email it in or can you actually fill the application out online and send it in? It's like what I saw was that you just have to like download the form. And I, I thought you had to bring it in person, but can, what, what is the online, uh, what is the ability for someone to do this all digitally? I think the, the, app, the initial application itself. So there, there's a couple of parts to this, and I, I think it's worth, since we're having the, the hearing, to go over some of the qualifications and the fact that I think you rightfully say there are different media uh, mediums now uh, uh, other than the traditional mediums of the past, and we've accommodated for that as well. So I'll let Council Bland talk about that. I think it's also worth noting that um, well, first thing is the application itself is online. Ultimately, when all of the supporting documents and all the criteria are met, the individual would then come down to one police plaza to get photographed and, 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 and the like. Um, I think what you may be referring to were some of the complaints, recent complaints is because of COVID, uh, there has, we, we obviously have to institute certain safeguards not to have a cache of people gathering in um, in the press office to get photographed. So the, the 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 amount of people processed in any given day has slowed down to account for the safety issues involved. But it's still being done. And the the other important piece is is that press passes are issued for a two year period. And what we have done is extended the expiration date to account for what's going on with COVID and the pandemic, and to account for the fact that we have slowed down in the amount of people that we're seeing in any given day. So press passes that were set to expire have been extended. So the individuals uh, that are the bearers of the press passes are not left with an expired press pass, so they can't do their job. With that said, I'd like Council Bland to talk about some of the criteria that are in place for getting a press pass and uh, the various new medium that, you know, that have been accounted for. So again, the standards or requirements for getting a press card is in the uh, rules of the city of New York. Um, it is described there and outlined in those rules. Again, the individual who is a member of the press will just uh, is required to have six stories, photographs, uh, books, print, digital media within a 24 month period of time. Understanding, of course, that uh, because of COVID that there may not have been a lot of press conferences or we've uh, not had parades. The department has taken that into account. So any stories involving COVID, uh, whether or not that was outside where police lines are established was 
acceptable as a requirement for the press card. And I'd just like to add that this is not a subjective standard, it's an objective standard. So if you have the six stories in the 24 month period, you're getting a card. There's no further review about the stories. Um, I guess I guess my concern would be like, like let's take the example of last year when we have one of the most covered moments you know, in modern times with all the, all the uh, marches and, and protests going on, you have a uh, tremendous amount of folks who are showing up to document and report what's going on. And in some cases, you're right. Some folks may have just started their job. Maybe didn't have the documentation. Maybe we're from a new outlet or a newer outlet. Um, I, you know, it feels to me like, uh, you know, there was a lot of potential here for folks to not be able to not qualify. I mean, in addition to, I think there was a, a moment where the system shut down, but I, you know, I, I guess the question is, uh, you know, are the qualifications as they need, as, as they exist today, um, allowing folks who are in either in a new position or in a new media outlet the ability to, you know, act, and, and in that case, we're talking about last year, like, I think you certainly did need a press credential based on what it affords you to be able to go over so police lines and get access to places where you probably ordinarily weren't allowed to go. Uh, although I think we saw some issues there as well. But I guess my question is, like, it, you, are we, a, you know, I think, I think the aspiration here, let me just say, is to make sure that folks who are desiring to be able to do their jobs some who, who we have here today are really well established and I have probably had that press credential years, but there's lots of new folks who are maybe even starting a new, new position and, you know, maybe don't qualify. And so I think that's one of the things we would like to look at. Um, yes, um, the question, I, I think, can we start with the expiration date for a second? I, I was told that everybody's uh, 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 press passes or maybe Congress, but I was told that they're all expiring on January 15th. Are they all, I, I know you, ex, you extended them, but why would they all be due to expire at the same time? That feels like that creates an unnecessary backlog of work for the agency. The press credentials are given on a two year cycle and that's as written in the rules. So every two years they're issued and they're set to expire on the same date every two years. Um, again, and taking into account of COVID, the department has extended that expiration date. So those cards that have an expiration date of January 15th are now due to expire on April 15th. So we're taking into account that we're not able to process the 25 or 30 individuals per day due to COVID restrictions. And now we're processing about 10 per day. I, I get that. I just don't understand why you would make them all expire on the same day, being that that just creates an unnecessary amount of work for the agency at one time versus like uh, just extending them out. Um, the, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll stop there. I mean, I just, but I wanted to just clarify one last thing. Right now, just, just in terms of get applying for one, you can email it in and the only thing you have to do in person is to go pick it up and take your, and take your photo rather. That is correct. You can email the application along with your submissions of your supporting documentation we review it online and we'll schedule an appointment date. When you come in, the only thing you have to do is bring that in documentation with you. We'll give, take a, your picture and give you your card at that moment. Okay. Um, well, look, we have, I think, we'll, you know, as part of this dialogue, I think we'll talk about you know, criteria qualifications in addition to talking about where to exactly house this to make sure that we are, I, it's, it's just a necessary, like, I just feel like it's a necessary modernization either way to continue to look at this process um, and to uh, make sure that we're making it e easy and accessible for folks. Uh, and in particularly in light of the concerns people have raised to, 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 to me and the council around access and things like that. Um, and we'll continue to work with the mayor's office about exactly where we think it should be housed hearing their, uh, their issues on this as well. So thank you. Thank you, the chair. Thank you, Council Member Powers. I will now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you would like to ask a question and you have not yet raised your hand, please do so now. You will have a total of five minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelist. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and I will let you know when your time is up. Once I have called on you, please wait until the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your question. 
First, we will hear from Council Member Rodriguez, followed by Council Member Yeager. Council Member Rodriguez, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time starts now. Thank you, and congratulations to Paul Chor and his new responsibility to be a legislative director, someone that has been always, you know, accessible to all of us in his previous role. So good luck in in your responsibility. You know, you make all of us very proud. And I, I, I think that, you know, no doubt that as you look for the participants in this soon, you see the faces of so many advocates for the members of the press and lawyers. And I think that everyone uh, recognize and give credit to the members of the press for the great job that they're doing. So addressing, you know, the press uh, ability to you know, get the pass, get the credential, do the job is very important for democracy. Uh, but one area that I want to touch is about allowing the members of the media to get the, the plate uh, to go and use the vehicle to cover story. As a former, and of course, like as someone that advocate for the city of New York to put together a plan to reduce the numbers of people that have car from 1.4 million that we have today to 1 million by 2030, and not into incentivizing anyone to go and get car. I know that many members of the press, when there's event, press conference, that any the mayor, whoever put it together, Queens, any borough, they take the train. However, we also know that New York City has a lot of area of transportation deserts. In New York City, we have you know, teachers have the, the permit to park the car, elected official, and many other agency. What is holding us to also allow members of the press to have the, the plate and that will allow them also to not call it privilege, but to have the right also to park the car when they are covering a story. Sure. Do you, uh, Paul? Do you want me to handle that? Yeah. Why don't, why don't you handle it, and I can add anything else after. Sure. So I, I think, Council Member, I'm familiar with the bill. I, I don't know if it was reintroduced, but this is uh, a topic that I know you've um, you've advocated for uh, in the Transportation Committee for for a while, and there's been legislation introduced. I mean, I think in line with, with our prior testimonies. And I think a lot of the press would, would agree that, you know, our officers make accommodations for press vehicles, press vans covering breaking news stories. I know that what the bill is aiming to do is to go far beyond that. And we recognize that there is a need for press uh, to park at, when they're covering news stories. I think the way that particular bill was drafted left a lot of ambiguity. But we certainly said back then, and we, we reiterate now that we're open to speaking with you further about you know, how that would look. I mean, I just think that that particular bill in its current form was so broadly written that it, it just wouldn't be feasible. More than happy to continue conversation. And, and I think that you know, that's a, you know, the, the positive, uh, energy that we can have in any conversation around this. And again, for my friend in the street block, I'm not calling to give unlimited press permit. I'm not saying that I encourage him for members of the media not to pay for whatever. This is about, you know, as a teacher that I was, that I, was I know that, and we work with this administration to accommodate a numbers of those permits. And the, this is not something new. The members of the press, they used to have them. Uh, Bloomberg stopped them as they he, as he also did it with a with a teacher. So this is about restoring, and uh, but more than happy to work with you guys and you know our colleague at City Hall and DOT to see how we can make progress with that bill. So thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Council Member Yeager. Council Member Yeager, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time starts now. 
Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, my question is for Commissioner Chernyavsky, and uh, I, I hope you can just help me uh, get some of the, the policy reasons uh, on the record for why we have uh, press passes in the first place. And my question really is, starting off with that, why do we have, what's the reason for a press pass? I mean, why can't anyone just go anywhere they want in the city? Uh, I think um, it's, it's a balance, really. It's we're trying to maintain the integrity of sometimes crime scenes or emergency situations where police lines are set up. But at the same time, there's a recognition that the press, I mean, I think we all agree, is the fourth branch of government. It keeps us all true and honest and reports the news to keep the public informed. So there is an absolute need to have um, to have press uh, that's able to have a vantage point that they can deliver the news uh, to people sitting at home so those folks are aware. So to the extent we can facilitate press going behind police lines in a manner that doesn't disrupt crime scenes, contaminate evidence, or doesn't create unsafe uh, conditions, we want to facilitate that. And the press pass is the vehicle we use to do that. Well, if that's true, and, and, uh, and some of us uh, may actually believe the press is the first branch of government, not the fourth. Um, but if that's true, then uh, why wouldn't the police department be the best uh, arbiter of who ought to and ought not have a press credential in the city? I mean, I don't have a press credential. I can't just go anywhere I want. Um, why wouldn't the, uh, the police department be the best uh, arbiter of that question? Well, I think, uh, I think recognizing uh, the current movement of, uh, you, know, you know, I think where, where we're going and reimagining policing, I think, you know, there are certain things that uh, rightly we need to look at and examine whether they truly belong within the police department, whether they fall within the department's core mission. I think uh, the mayor has made uh, a series of commitments, you know, from vending to homeless. Um, and this is just yet another example of when we're looking at uh, duties or responsibilities um, that, the, the, that the department currently carries, uh, there's a re-examination of what should or should not remain here. Okay. Um, if, if contamination uh, or preventing the contamination of a crime scene, uh, uh, maintaining public safety, maintaining order is the reason why uh, the, from time to time, places in the city are cordoned off and, but for the, uh, uh, the holding a press credential, one would not be able to go by actually either a press credential or a police department badge, would, do you believe that DCAS or uh, the mayor's office of media or another agency is in a better position than the police department to maintain the order at a particular crime scene or a dangerous location? I, I can take this, Oleg, if that's okay, and then I'll turn it over to you. Um, Council member, that's a great question. Uh, the, what we're envisioning is not removing PD or having MOM officers or MOM uh, staff be at these uh, scenes. It is really talking about the application process, not the actual um, work that gets done or the implementation of how those press passes are used. So in, in that scenario, PD would still be responsible uh, in their best judgment to allow press uh, in, a, in a crime scene or any of the scenarios that you mentioned. Okay. Um, the, I, view, I view legislation as, uh, maybe I'm somewhat alone on this, but I'm used to that here, uh, as a tool to fix something that's broken, uh, to, you know, to look at the way we do things right now and to say that the only way to do it a little better is to do it legislatively. Do you believe right now that the system is broken? The system of issuing press credentials is somehow not working right? And I, I offer that to, to the police department. Uh, I mean, with respect to the Office of City Legislative Affairs, I think they're the ones who are doing the work right now. And I'd, I'd like to hear from the deputy commissioner on whether or not he believes that the police department is somehow not doing it right right now. I mean, I, I don't think that's, you know, I don't think that's really where where the question is. Um, I think, I certainly think that we run a fair process. I think that 
Uh, I think the numbers bear that out. Um, you know, five suspensions in five years and over 3,000 press passes issued in any two-year cycle. I think that bears, the, the data bears that out. I think realistically, as I said before, that, you know, if we're in a time that we're reimagining policing, that we're uh, looking at what, what the police department's footprint needs to be or should be, uh, and given the various tasks that we're involved in. And I think uh, without speaking to the fairness of the process, which I truly believe is fair uh, in the way we've administered it, if the decision uh, by the council and, and the, the decision by the administration is that it should be housed uh, elsewhere, we fully support that. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to ask uh, for specifics of the five suspensions, except that I want to reiterate for the record that in five years, as, as you stated, there have been five suspensions. Uh, and, and I think that that is an incredibly low number uh, given, given you know, how big the city is and how many things are going on on a day-to-day -day basis and how much the press is working uh, throughout those, those places to see what's going on and to get the closest shot that they can and get the, as close as possible to get the information out to the public. Uh, five suspensions means to me at least that the police department is uh, is pretty forgiving uh, when somebody with a press card wants to push the envelope and get as close as possible. I, I haven't heard um, an outcry, uh, perhaps I don't talk to the press that often, but I haven't heard this great outcry that the police department uh, has not been uh, willing and able in every single way uh, and actually acted out working with the press. Um, I, I'd like to ask, uh, um, a question regarding uh, the application process and the and the amount of evidence that you need uh, to to make the case that somebody is actually a working member of the press, and I'll preface that by saying again, I write a lot of things. I, I I'm published quite often. I write op eds, but I am not a member of the press. And if I were to uh, fill out an application and submit it with copies of everything that I've written and say, I, you know, well, give me a press credential because every once in a while I write something interesting, uh, I think you'd be, uh, you'd rightfully turn me down. Do you believe uh, that the police department's criteria for determining what constitutes a member of the press entitled to cross police lines? And I want to differentiate that one could be a member of the press and also not necessarily need uh, to bear the right to cross police lines. Um, do you believe that that your criteria is too harsh or too demanding? Uh, I, I don't. I mean, I think, you know, as as Council Bland had had outlined, uh, really, the the basis is six stories, six local stories over a two year period. And I wouldn't be so sure that you wouldn't qualify for press pass council member. Uh, you may, if you have six stories that you've written over the past two years that deal with local issues uh, that are, you know, I think, you know, I could be mis <laughs> misstating it and you tell me, you tell me if I am, but I, you know, I, I, I think, it, best, don't worry. Uh, no, no, but I think, uh, I think, <laughs> again, I think it goes back to the numbers bearing this out. Um, I think that, you know, we have over 3000 press passes issued. Uh, where, you know, having a revocation hasn't happened in the five-year look back that we did. A suspension was very limited. So, you know, I think we're very judicious about uh, pulling the press pass. I think we're certainly, we certainly train our officers. There is a comprehensive training, both at the academy at every promotion. Um, every time a sergeant, lieutenant, or captain gets promoted, uh, the press team goes in and trains them about, you know, how to deal with the press at, at scenes of events. Uh, so, yeah, I think it was, uh, I think to answer your question, I think it's a fair process. And I think it, the standards that we've created, at least when we've handled it, is um, just ensures that the individuals applying for press passes seeking to go behind police lines are actually engaged in the business of, uh, reporting the news. Okay, I, my, my, uh, the sergeant hasn't announced it, but I, I see uh, on the video here that my clock uh, has expired. So I'll ask the chairman just uh, for a brief moment or two, if I may. 
um, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, the, thank you, Chair. The, you know, I, as I view it, um, uh, and, and I, I don't want to speak for the press at all, but um, I, I believe that the press for the most part uh, has, has, and I think your numbers bear it out, uh, have acted responsibly uh, in those who carry the press credential. Um, obviously, the concern, I think, in setting the criteria for who should or shouldn't get a press credential is based on the idea that you don't want everybody, namely a guy like me, saying, hey, every once in a while I write something, give me a press card so I can go wherever I feel like and cross your lines that are there for very important civic purposes. Um, so, you know, I, I, going back to the point that I made at the beginning, I view legislation as a tool to fix something that's broken. Uh, sometimes we tend to do things uh, where we promulgate legislation as solutions in hunt of a problem. And I'm sitting here this morning and we're 48 or thereabouts minutes in, and I'm still trying to hunt for the problem and I haven't seen it yet. Um, and my brother councilman who uh, proposed this legislation, I know is quite wise uh, in, in his ideas about the future of the city. I'm just trying to hunt for the problem. And I hope that uh, sometime during the course of this morning's hearing, uh, we'll learn what the problem actually is. And with that, I yield back to the chair with my thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Committee Council, do we have anyone else? Chair, no other hands are raised, so feel free to ask any follow-up questions at this time. Thank you so much. See, uh, actually, Councilmember Powers, I think he wants to chime in uh, to uh, Councilmember Yeager's uh, comment. Thank you. I, I, I always appreciate Councilmember Yeager and his, uh, his insights, and we are uh, a dear friend, so I take no offense to any, any questions that might criticize it. But I, I will say, I just wanted to add some commentary to this as we're thinking about what people that are testifying ahead. I, I don't actually think suspensions is really the measurement of how the system works. I think it's whether there's access to the press credentials in the first place. I have somebody just tweeted at me who said who covers transportation issues for the last 15 years who said they have never been able to get one. I have a photographer who's a constituent who's just, I mean, these are just the ones I'm getting right now, who's saying that uh, he, he has both the uh, the frustration with this potential expiration date issue, but also has had his own issues in terms of getting it. I, I've heard these anecdotes. I've heard from a photographer who became a reporter who was not able to get a press credential in that period of time because uh, that person needed, uh, I think, six, uh, you know, proof of six different things and was unable to prove that with that, that had the person's name on it. So I've heard these stories and I think that the access to it is actually more of the issue than the suspensions and taking away of it. We also have folks on here I know who have had historical issues with getting it as well. So I want us to think about making it easier. I want us to think about modernizing it. I want to, I also to frankly say like, I'm, this is not an attack on the NYPD, but I just frankly think that any agency that is gonna be as widely covered as either the PD to the Department of Transportation, whatever it may be, should not be the one that issuing the press passes if you wanna have absolute certainty and clarity in the freedom of the press in New York City. We have a mayor's office of media and entertainment. It is, I think it makes a lot of sense for them to be in the business of, of issuing their press uh, press credentials. What we need the NYPD's uh, um, uh, uh, partnership on is making sure that folks are acknowledging that when people show up and want to use the press credential and get to the uh, place where it's uh, needed, whether it's at City Hall or it's uh, going over a police line. So, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I just want to clarify that as we're thinking about this issue that I think access is an issue. I think suspensions is not really how I'd measure this. And I'm not even here to say to NYPD anything. I'm, I just feel like this should be housed in an agency that does media entertainment, that doesn't get widely covered by the NYPD. And I think we, it's a, just a good opportunity for all of us to reconsider and revisit all the things that make up the press credential process in New York City right at this moment. So I just wanted to add that in. And I have no questions. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Powers. I have a few questions. Uh, I'll often like to leave my question to the end so my colleagues uh, could ask. I'm just curious, uh, Director Ochoa, uh, if you could share with us uh, what additional resources are going to be needed uh, to implement uh, Intro 2118. Uh, will the NYP? Uh, PD be able or should they move uh, the press credential staff? Or are you going to get new 
staff in the new agency? Any thoughts about that? Yeah, that, those are great questions, uh, Chair. So uh, you're absolutely right. MOM is a small office. We do think they're the right office to do to take down this work. And we will be supporting them in uh, any new resources they may need, either technology or staffing wise, um, to get this done. We do not envision uh, anyone from PD's uh, civilian uh, workforce to be moving. I think this would have to be uh, just a, you know, a staffing issue and a resource issue for, for mom. Do you think you have enough staff there to, to do this type of work or are you gonna have to hire new staff? Just yeah, I think, yeah, I think we're gonna have to talk to them about it and, and what bandwidth they have. I know they, they do work very hard with the a, a small team they have. So it may require um, some staffing, but we were gonna, we're gonna help them out and work that out on the back end uh, with our friends at OMB. Uh, one of the thoughts I, I had, and I know there are some, uh, uh, perhaps a need for charter revision if we were to do this. Uh, my wise counsel uh, has pointed out to me, but uh, the county clerk uh, being another option, uh, being that of uh, independent body, uh, that so, might uh, be some point of consideration. I uh, wanted to know, should uh, police officers uh, or other city officials be permitted to uh, to cease uh, press credential without first conducting a hearing? That's a good question. I'm gonna turn it over to NYPD to talk about what they do currently. I believe it's only in instances where something egregious happened, but I do yeah. wanna turn it over to NYPD. Sure, so in, in terms of seizures, you know, you could have, again, I think uh, Paul said it right, in egregious circumstances where I mean, I'll give you an example, say for example, we're at the scene of a shooting and we establish police lines and there's a determination made by officers and we allow uh, members, credentialed members of the press to go beyond the police lines. And then there's a determination made by uh, detectives or police officers on the scene that the police line has to be extended because they found shell casings or whatever. If a member of the press, for example, refuses to move and they're not abiding by the orders of the officers or detectives at the scene, uh, they may pull the press pass. But historically, when we do a look at this, they get it back uh, the next day or, or later that day. And we certainly set up protocols um, for uh, police officers or detectives at the scene to reach out to our press office that has regular dealings with members of the press so they can try to intervene so it doesn't get to the extreme of pulling the press pass at the scene. But again, that prep of pulling the press pass at the scene in those limited circumstances when it's done is not even deep the suspension because the individual would get it back in short order. Do you have a record how many times uh, we have such occurrences? how many times they're being taken away and given back on the same day or the next day? I, I don't have that number with me, but I'll, I'll take a look into it and get back to you. Okay. Uh, to what extent uh, with the new agency, I'm not going to assume which agency is going to be, but we'll collaborate with the NYPD, City Hall, or other emergency service, services in issuing press credential, if at all. I can take this, Oleg. Um, I think you're right, Council Member, that the new the transition needs to be seamless, and there's going to have to be collaboration. As NYPD mentioned, they've been doing this for decades, so it is uh, very important that uh, that you know if, when Mom takes this on or if Mom takes this on, that we coordinate with the NYPD and the relevant agencies to make sure that uh, you know they learn the process and the transition is seamless. And once they learn that process. Would there be any, any form of engagement, involvement uh, by the NYPD or any other agency? Yeah, the way we are envisioning this is the, the process, the sort of the application process of the press, press credentials would be housed at MOM, but the actual implementation of how those press credentials are used would still fall on, under the NYPD. So yes, uh, your, to your question, yes, that, that will definitely happen. Wanted to ask you 
Uh, if you could be specific as to how many press credentials by type does the NYPD typically issue in a given year uh, to how many journalists? Do you have that? How many, how many press credentials by type and to how many journalists? Yeah. Over the, uh, again, we do the press credentials over a two year cycle and over that two year cycle, we issue approximately 3000 uh, press credentials to individual journalists. In addition, um, we issue a number of reserve cards to news organizations or news outlets for them to give to journalists who don't have their own individual six stories to qualify for their own individual card. And how many reserve cards are we talking about? I don't have the exact number for the reserve cards in itself, but we'll check DCPI records for that information and get back to you. Do you know how many major, major networks do you give out these two? I think all major networks have yeah. right? You might not know the number, but do you know how many networks do you give it out to? I think they all, I. Look, I'll, I'll double check, I'll verify, but I think all major networks have it. And the question is, is how many, I guess, non-major networks have it? And we'll give you a comprehensive number. But I, I think it's fair to say that the major networks have reserve passes. So I think one of the council members had mentioned, I think maybe uh, council member powers that if you have somebody that just started uh, as a reporter, they can use one of these rever uh, reserve passes and cover a story because they're acting under the umbrella of their organization. Just to be clear, the 3,000 does not include the event passes, correct? Or did they do? The event, the one time? No. Yeah. No, it's not. So these are 3,000 different individuals who are journalists. Uh, who have passes, right? I just want to. I just want to be clear. Absolutely. Okay. Great. I only have a couple of more questions, and then I'm going to pass it to Councilmember Yeager, who's very eager today. I mean, I, only, I didn't know uh, you were so eager regarding the press, uh, Councilmember Yeager. I move. I move. Uh, in in June 2020, the NY. PD proposed new rules to govern press credential. Please describe the reason for these proposed rules and why now. So yeah, we, we proposed new rules uh, and it didn't, I think Paul had mentioned earlier, it didn't affect the rules about application for press credentials. It improved the due process rights that reporters had in the case of a suspension or revocation of press credentials. So we had a process in place um, and we, as part of, Part of litigation but also something that we have been looking at we wanted to improve these this process uh and that's what the purpose of those rules were those proposed rules i should say how do you measure whether uh they actually uh improve uh these rules made the process better well i think transparency anytime you 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 shed more light on the process and make it more transparent, that's an improvement in and of itself. And the nature of, uh, of the rulemaking process is that if, for example, we, we find that you know, the rule isn't working the way it was intended, then you could always change the rule and improve upon the rule. But I think you know, it's very hard to measure it now, but I think is broadly stated, anytime you could make a process more transparent, to the public and to the individuals that are affected by these rules, such as the press, that's an improvement in itself. Uh, I believe there are gonna be members of the press who are gonna testify for some examples of seizure and it has led to some allegations that journalists were not informed of the right to appeal hearing, uh, to an appeal hearing or the reason for a seizure. Uh, what changes have the NYPD made to this procedure in order to ensure that journalists are informed of all procedures related to press credential? And also, are you looking uh, any other ways uh, to make it better? Well, I think the rulemaking, as, as we said, the, the rulemaking process is aimed directly at, at what you've just stated. 
So we have the proposed rules. They were put out for public comment to include members of the press as well. Uh, those comments have come in and we've been working on those rules diligently and incorporating uh, some of the comments that we've heard both from members of the press and from the public. I'm gonna pass it to Council Member Yeager. I know we have a member of the press, so if we could be parsimonious at this moment, I really appreciate it. Uh, but Council Member Yeager. Your time starts now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll be brief. I just want to touch on the topic of the reserve cards just to make sure that uh, uh, that, that information is, is uh, is properly recorded here this morning. Um, the, as I understand it, this so the, the department issues approximately three thousand press cards over a two year pe two year period. These are the individual cards that are um, uh, that that are tied to the record of the individual member of the press who's able to demonstrate uh, his or her right to have the press card based on his or her submissions. And then there are these reserve cards that the uh, media outlets slash publications, et cetera, have, I guess, in some editor's desk drawer and says to a random reporter, hey, you weren't able to qualify for the PD press card. Here's one, go cover this. Is this am I properly describing how the reserve card works? Yes, that is correct. Okay, so the, the, and the reserve card uh, when issued to a uh, working member of the press by a publication or media outlet gives the holder all the rights, privileges, et cetera, of, of the actual press card that bears the name of the holder? That is correct. Okay. So have, I guess this is more a deep dive then. Has the department received uh, any requests for reserve cards from a, from a media outlet or publication that it has either declined or not been able to accommodate for any reason without being specific, if you can just let me know what that reason is. I, I, see, I see Mr. Siegel is here, so he's gonna, he's gonna uh, tell me if I'm, if I'm asking this wrong when he gets on, but I guess he's nodding, okay? And I have immense respect for his, for his uh, uh, comprehension of the First Amendment and he will correct me later. Um, I'd, like to ask the, I'd like to ask PD for that. Um, I'm not aware of us denying a uh, request for reserve cards. Um, we have limited the amount of reserve cards that are given to a particular outlet, depending upon how large the outlet is. So if it's a difference between a large outlet, like a, a local a newspaper that have a lot of reporters or a brand new outlet that may have one or two um, members of, of their organization. Are you, are you in a position with the information in front of you to tell us what, say, you know, a large outlet, let's say, I don't want to single anyone out, but let's say the New York Times, paper of record, uh, how many reserve cards they might have? And if it's not something you're able to say, then I understand that that's fine. I do not have that information in front of me. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And with that, let me turn it over uh, to the committee council. I want to thank uh, the panelists uh, for your answers. And we will definitely be uh, continuing our discussions uh, with uh, the sponsor, prime sponsor of the bill uh, with the administration. And now we're looking forward to hear uh, from the member of the members of the press committee council. Thank you, Chair. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait, in, wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would now like to welcome Jane Tillman Irving to testify, followed by Mickey Osterreicher and then Norman Siegel. Jane Tillman Irving, you may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. 
Your time starts now. Thank you very much. My name is Jane Tillman Irving. I'm the president of the New York Press Club and a retired reporter and news writer for a number of media outlets, but mostly for WCBS News Radio 880 for many decades. I'd like to thank you for holding this hearing. It's a very important topic. I'm going to speak somewhat extemporaneously and provide you with written testimony. We're a membership organization founded in 1948 to represent the interests of all journalists in this city. And uh, we are the position of the New York Press Club is that we believe that the issuance of press cards should remain with the New York City Police Department. We, prefer, we, we would prefer to see that power re remain with the NYPD, but with more clearly defined uh, requirements for the suspension or the revocation of press credentials and possibly civilian input. Now that doesn't mean organizations like ours. We're not quite sure what but civilian input would be a good idea. The press card allows for passage behind press lines by emergency, I mean, police lines, emergency lines that are set by the police department. Therefore, we think the police department is the organization that should issue it and determine how those press cards are used. Now, there have been times when, and particularly recently last summer, when the police and the press were operating at more ad, in, in, a, in a more adversarial way than they have previously or in recent years. We'd like to, we recognize that that happens and we would like to see the police department recognize that we are all trying to keep the city informed and safe. They're concerned with safety. They're, we're concerned with information. We're not the fourth branch of government in the sense that, uh, to use a cliche, we're writing the first draft of history and to put on it, to use another cliche, we are afflicting the comfortable and comforting the afflicted. That sometimes makes us adversaries. But we are. we believe that the police department with perhaps some modification is certainly the best organization to, to issue press credentials. Also, Chairman Cabrera mentioned background checks. This is the first we've heard of that. And frankly, I find that a bit disturbing. I'm not sure what a background check would mean in this instance. And I don't necessarily, I don't think that that is the purview of issuing press credentials. So to sum up, as a person who has had many, um, many years of press, card, of press card issuances, I think that it should remain with the NYPD with modifications. We thank you. We look forward to working with you on this. Thank you so much. Uh, just a point of clarification. I need a point of clarification regarding background checks, whether there, there were any of any sort. And so that was clarified. And I think it's important the public uh, knows and we are able to call up on the NYPD whether that is done uh, at all. And so that was uh, put forth. So thank you. Thank you for uh, mentioning that. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back to committee council to call up on um, members as he's uh, someone already, one of my colleagues have a question. Thank you, Chair. Next, we'll hear questions from Council Member Powers. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you for the testimony. Um, I just have, you know, basically one question, which is what I raised earlier, which is, you know, I know something you care about, for sure, of course, but, you know, to, to me, well, let me ask this in a question. Do, do you feel don't don't do you feel like there is a conflict in a large city and in a functioning democracy with an agency that had that is the largest agency in the city, one of the largest in the country, and is uh, the recipient of lots of press coverage, notably in the last year, to be the entity issuing 
and and have the authority to revoke the ability for someone to have access to a to a press credential and to access to a press uh, to a police or or a site or a city hall or something like that. Do do you see any conflict between those two things? The freedom of the press to cover large agency that is widely covered and that, that also has the ability to determine who gets access to a press pass? Well, I don't think that thus far there has been that much of a conflict. There may be conflicts at certain events at certain times, but I think that the system has worked fairly well as far as, for the most part, last summer may have been, um, and not necessarily an anomaly, we have had, we have seen restrictions on the press from various uh, administrations, more and more so. We are sometimes pinned farther down the block than we'd like to be away from the action. And admittedly, when I was a reporter on the street decades ago, this did not happen as frequently. And this is a concern. And that's why we think that there should be some kind of civilian participation. I understand the point you're making and it's not a bad one, but I do think that if the issue is going behind police lines, the best judges of that are the police. But uh, so I, I think the counterpoint to that though, to be frank, is that there may be the wrong one for the right, the reason that I'm stating, which is that they are in the middle of a protest, for instance, as the incident that I think would be most relevant to us right now, would yes. be the wrong, where they are the ones who are a major uh, a piece of the coverage to be exactly the wrong ones. And not because anybody has to dislike the NYPD to believe that, but that you would, might believe that um, not having that agency that is, is so widely covered being the determining factor on those press credentials would just be the way to ensure and to, and to ensure in all cases. And so let me ask you a different question. Do you see a conflict? What it would be your concern about the mayor's office of media entertainment having, as an example, this is what the mayor has said they support, having access to that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's having authority. Over. Having the authority to yeah. uh, issue it. I think that the concern is, for the most part, that the police at least recognize that this is a credential. I'm holding up old ones, but the credential that they themselves have issued. I don't know that they are going to respond as favorably to another agency's issuance. I don't know. I can very Im easily imagine and my colleagues, I've discussed this with, of course, and uh, can, I don't think that they can, I, I can easily imagine a police officer on the job saying, I don't know what that credential is. I don't know who they are, even though, even though they might very well know. And you go back to that line. I can very easily see that. I don't, I think that the press credential issued by the police department offers a certain amount of insurance, not much in that regard, but some more than uh, another agency might. Do you, do you see a problem in a city where one agency doesn't acknowledge the work of another agency? Not really, but I see the potential for it. I definitely I, see- I, mean, I see it as a really large problem if one agency is issuing press credentials and another agency won't acknowledge that. I mean, that to me is like a breakdown of some public confidence and trust if agencies aren't able to uh, work together and to one can issue and the other can acknowledge. I mean, it would be no different than, I suppose, the NYPD showing up to a place where another agency has issued something, a health, a health permit or something like that and doing enforcement on it acknowledging that the work was issued by one agency, but that they play a role in it. And I, I think there is a, I think there is an issue with the, if there's a fear of lack of cooperation, I think that's an issue that exists and we should also have a conversation about, but I, but I, but I recognize you, I recognize your concern that it functionally in the field, there may be uh, a disconnect. What, what is, you know, 
with, with the with the understanding that you know I I think the mayor has said you know potentially MOM I am open to that or another agency as well. Can you just um, uh, talk to us about if you moved it to another agency, for instance, what might be necessary to help solve those issues around making sure that the police, when you show up to a scene, would acknowledge it? Is it you know representation of something on the badge? Is it um, like what, what other what other measures might give you more confidence? I guess in the I think that would be, uh, I think the proof there would be in the action. And I don't, I'm not sure at this point that it is, that we want to risk that. I think it, I think that it should, obviously the NYPD wants to move out of the press credential business, but uh, our position is that we would prefer that if they are going to pre be issued, and of course they should be, then we believe the NYPD should be the issuing agency. I also was interested in council member Rodriguez's point about the placards. We have, the placards are very important for parking and people at police, I mean, uh, reporters arriving at stories often find that they have no place to park. Many a time I took a cab or the subway to a story because I knew I would not have a place to park the WCBS mobile unit. Okay. Um, all right. Well, thank thank you for your testimony, and um, I, I I think there's a way to you know address some of the concerns you're being that are being raised here regarding um, access and cooperation and things like that. But I, I do recognize your your concern. I know we've chatted about these in the past. So thank you for your testimony and taking time with the questions as well. And I'll hand it over. I see uh, others have their hands up. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Next, we will hear questions from Council Member Yeager. Your time starts now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, good morning, Ms. Tillman Irving. Uh, I've never Ms. seen Irving. your face. It's Ms. I've Irving. Your voice. I'm a little kid. Thank you. And, uh, it's interesting to put a face to it, and it's really good to see you. Um, uh, you. I, I would like to, to make the following point just to, to, uh, to bring back something that you mentioned. Um, uh, obviously, you you see it uh, you see it as okay and not objectionable that it remain uh, with the police department. But something that is just you know I guess been bandied about uh, this idea that the police department is the most covered entity in the city and ought it be issuing the press credentials being a valid question. Uh, but at the same time, the mayor is probably the most covered individual in the city of New York. And uh, the police department, for whatever its, uh, its, its benefits or detriments, is arguably, I think, fair to say, far more independent of the mayor's uh, arm, I think has been demonstrated, than, say, the mayor's office of media, or than DCAS even, uh, as we've learned over the last several years. And what I'm saying is not a reflection on the individual who currently holds the office, but rather the office itself. The mayor of New York City is probably, uh, very fair to say, the most covered individual in the city. Um, does it make sense that, that an agency with, I guess, less independence than the police department be, uh, and certainly an agency like the Office of Media, which is not a, a, an independent department as much as an arm of the mayor's office, uh, be issuing these permits? I think that is one of the reasons that we believe that the police department is the better agency. We believe that there may be changes in the requirements, in the, um, the, re the requirements for revoking or suspending a press credential. There can be changes, but that is why we believe that the NYPD is the best agency for this operation. And I want to go to your second point, um, and this is perhaps a place where Mr. Siegel and I might agree. Um, I, I also have a problem, uh, maybe it's not a fully developed thought right here, but the idea of the background checks uh, being a necessary predicate to receiving a press credential. Once an applicant has made the demonstration of being a bona fide member of the press uh, by presenting the, uh, the coverage that he or she has done in the past, and proving uh, that she's an employee of a press organization or has actually participated in coverage and things of that nature. I'm not really sure what information would be elicited from a background check. 
that would be conclusive that an individual ought to or ought not receive a press credential. My point being that, so what if a year before that person was arrested for something or not, or has some kind of criminal history? I mean, we're a city that believes in second chances. And if somebody is working for the press and is able to prove that they're working for the press, uh, I'm not really sure what information would be elicited in a in a background check, and I'm curious if if you can think of any situation where a reporter might have been denied uh, access to a press credential based on those reasons. Are you asking me? I'm asking you. You're the only one up there. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, I don't know of any either, and that's why I was questioning. Uh, the chairman, Chairman Cabrera, said something about background checks. And this was something that had not come up before. And I found that very concern, um, a matter of, of, of considerable concern. That's why I, I responded. Let me interject because my name was brought up. I want to be clear. I think there's some confusion here. I'm not suggesting there should be background checks. I don't know why is anybody even insinuating that. I was here, I asking you know. whether there were any background checks. I see. And the reason I, I asked, the reason I asked is because in the 11 years I've been a council member here, no one has ever asked the NYPD that question. It's very possible that they were, and, and no one in the press ever knew about it. And so I wanted it on the record to make sure that such behavior and actions were not taking place. Sure. I, I, if I may. Thank you very much sure. for playing. Thank you. Go ahead, I can, I can, I can, I you have extra time, of course. Um, if I may, I, can, I could clear up the confusion. It's it, The reason that I think uh, a background checks is, is at issue here at the hearing, maybe not at issue, but at least being discussed, is because there is language in the draft of this bill that would require that an agency, an unnamed agency, do background checks. I think the agency that is most typical to do background checks is DOI or NYPD. And I think it's a fair question whether or not background checks ought to be a prerequisite to receiving a press credential if the bona fides of the actual applicant are met uh, uh, by, by reason of demonstrating the, that the person who's applying is actually a working member of the press. And I think that's always a fair question. We just don't want to give these press cards to people like me and you, Mr. Chair. Uh, but surely, if somebody can demonstrate that they are a working member of the press, it ought not necessarily matter uh, if somebody has a background check that, you know, Maybe you don't want to put them behind the, you know, counter of a bank, but, uh, you know, we do have the First Amendment and, and there has to be a very, very, very high bar uh, to restricting the access of the press to information, in my view. And uh, uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I think that's all. Ms. Irving, it's good to see you. Thank you very much. And I yield back thank to you. the Chair. And thank you, uh, uh, Councilor Yeager, and thank you for pointing that out. And of course, that's going to be... Uh... Uh, point of discussion that the committee would have with uh, the sponsor, the prime sponsor of the bill. Uh, who's, uh, so thank you so much. I believe uh, committee council, we have another uh, council member who has a question. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, next we'll hear questions from council member Levin. Your time starts now. Okay. Hi, Ms. Irving. Hello. Um, I, I just wanted to ask a question. Have you, has any, have, have you or any of your members have had experience um, of NYPD restricting access to credentialed members of the press um, in instances where they should have been uh, allowed, but you know, were were um, times when the the police department might might not want press to to be there. So, for example, at a at a protest. I mean, the 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 um, this this past summer, you know, was a a very um, uh, tense time between uh, the police department. Um, and people exercising their First Amendment rights of assembly, um, uh, national lawyers 
Guild, um, you know, people being arrested, National Lawyers Guild, identified members. Um, uh, I don't know if any members of the press were arrested, but is this a concern that your members have raised to you or that you've seen as an issue um, in, 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 uh, especially in, in this past year? Well, in this past year, we have seen that overall. We have seen, not necessarily, we have seen so, uh, uh, some press credential, uh, credentialed members of, of, of the press being not necessarily, uh, had, they have not had their, their credentials revoked or anything of that nature, but yeah. I know photographers who I believe have had that happen. But what concerns us is that over the years, there has been a certain lack of, um, they've been less forthcoming. And so the members of the press are frequently sequestered down the block from the action and penned mm -hmm. into small areas and unable to get close to whatever is taking place. Those are the kinds of things that we see more of in New York. Those are the kinds of things that are a concern. And it has been the case over various administrations, uh, very different. The Koch administration, the Dinkins administration were very different in their reactions to the press and the access gay, uh, garnered to the press as opposed to subsequent administrations. And that's what's been more of a concern. Now uh, that would be, in different mayoral administrations, but the police departments in those different mayoral administrations. So there's well, some they, kind of- The police, yes, the police departments in those administrations. And I, and we believe that certainly they were not uh, necessarily acting without the knowledge of the mayoral administration. I won't say that an order mm -hmm. came down or anything of that nature, but yeah. I we believe that there has been less access over the years. It's been gradual, but it has happened. I mean, I, I understand your concern about, um, you know, the police respecting a credential um, created by another agency. I mean, that is problematic if they don't recognize a credential created by another agency that's a rightful credential that gives them that, gives a member of the press that ability or authority. So that's, it's, that's, very problematic that they wouldn't um and shows we don't a, know that they wouldn't but we think that they would be more likely to represent one that they to respect and acknowledge one that they one that have they, yes that they have uh issued right understood understood but it, it kind of speaks to a little bit of a bigger concern too which is their uh recognizing of of, of other agencies authorities um and and you, and you said that um uh you don't know of any Journalists that were had their credentials revoked, maybe some, maybe photographers that were. But yeah. do you know of any instances where they were not allowed behind, behind, you know, or allowed access when when, well, when if you presenting establish, the credentials? If the police establish a perimeter, and that perimeter is at a distance from the action, as it were, then they're not being. Mm -hmm. They may not be. They they are allowed up to that point. But the point is not where the press yeah. needs to be in order to get the story. That's Do you know of any journalists that were arrested this summer during the protests? Just for doing their job? I, I don't, I'm not in New York. I'm, I don't, but there may be. And I'm, I'm not privy to everything okay. that has happened, but I don't know of any. But okay. certainly in other jurisdictions they have, they were, there were protests all over the country. And we, we saw a police, I mean, a, a reporter, arrested live on television in Minneapolis, a CNN mm -hmm. reporter. So it right. does happen. It does happen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Mr. Irving. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Um, I would now like to invite Mickey Osterreicher to testify. After that, I will be calling on Norman Siegel and then Jason B. Nichols. Mr. Osterreicher, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time starts now. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Cabrera and members of the council. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding this bill. My name is Mickey Ostreicher and I'm the general counsel of the National Press Photographers Association, 
I'm also speaking on behalf of the New York State Bar Association Media Law Committee and several other press organizations. I've been a photojournalist for about 40 years in both print and broadcast. Uh, we, when I say we, these organizations have submitted extensive comments in response to NYPD's notice regarding its proposed changes to the rules that govern the suspension and or revocation of NYPD issued press credentials and amending slash repealing certain sections of Title 38 of the RCNY. The rulemaking itself was part of a settlement coming from years of litigation over press credentialing. We appreciate the council's interest in improving the process, but we are extremely concerned that enactment of this bill would short circuit and undermine the rulemaking process, which has been months in the making and for which a final rule is long overdue, given that the NYPD reportedly completed its revisions in November 2020 and publication is still awaiting approval from the Corporation Council's office and the Mayor's Office of Operations. While the NYPD credentialing process is far from perfect, the rulemaking process must be finalized and reviewed before wholesale changes are made, especially in situations where press credentials other than those issued by NYPD have not been honored by officers and where NYPD issued credentials have been seized or threatened to be seized. We also are troubled that while the language of 2118 gives DCAS sole authority, it fails to specify that the procedures and the criteria for press credential qualification, issuance, suspension, revocation, and appeal, what those will be. Therefore, we respectfully request that further action on this measure be tabled until such time as the NYPD final rule is published and an assessment of its impact can be made. Alternatively, we propose that the bill be amended to include specific language detailing procedures and criteria for DCAS or whatever agency regarding press credentialing is made available. If that is not possible, then we must oppose this bill for the reasons stated. In the event that 2118 is enacted, we ask that we are included in helping to determine which agency will have authority over the credentialing process and develop any new policies and procedures. Um, I thank you for your time. We will be submitting more extensive written testimony uh, within the, follow, uh, the filing period following this hearing. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions and it looks like I might have a second or two. I just wanted to uh, also agree uh, with Mr. Irving uh, in, in terms of the fact that we believe that because uh, the NYPD is the ones on the street dealing with people with press credentials, We've seen time and time again, especially this summer, that press credentials from the State Department, from other cities have not been honored. It's like you might as well bring a note from your mother if you don't have an NYPD credential. So we're worried that if it's not an NYPD credential, uh, that it's not going to be respected on the street. Thank you. Next, we will hear questions from Council Member Adams. Your time starts now. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Chair Cabrera, for holding this, uh, this, this important hearing. Um, you know, we've met in the past. It's good to see you, Mickey. It's good to see you, Ms. Irving. Uh, I echo the sentiments of my colleague, uh, Calvin Yeager. And when we initially met a few months ago, that voice of yours is just, it just it brings us back to such a special place um, when media was different. I'll just put it that way. It was different. Um, and it's always great to hear your amazing voice. Uh, Mickey, I, I, I hear you as far as the integrity of the press pass is concerned for NYPD. Uh, I understand, and, and we've spoken about it, um, what, that, what that credential means across the board. Um, but you know, our concern with, with when we first started talking about um, um, this this bill, uh, a lot of it had to do with the uh, treatment of uh, of individuals, journalists that are not typical media. Over the course of this summer, when it came to the BLM protests, so. Um, 
my concern still is, um, Mickey, I hear you as far as uh, looking at the bill and maybe, you know, tweaking it in some areas, but to, to, to me to have this authority remain at NYPD, uh, it risks the same behavior happening again to these individuals. So I guess my question is to uh, Ms. Irving, are, are you concerned at all that if this, if this authority is, uh, is left with NYPD, if we leave it in the hands of NYPD, are you concerned at all that we will possibly see this, this behavior that I personally considered uh, to be uh, um, prejudicial? Um, I thought it was an abuse of power this summer. I thought that uh, some journalists were treated horribly by NYPD. So are you concerned at all that if this authority remains in the hands of NYPD, that this behavior would not continue in instances of peaceful protest? In the first place, Council Member Adams, thank you very much for your kind words. I appreciate it. Uh, I do, I am concerned, but we were also in a time where there was considerable animus toward the press from the highest office in the land. And we're not, and I don't expect to see that in the same way from the current administration. I think that there is a difference in climate from that part that will trickle down to a certain extent. And I think also that uh, we, we are hopeful that a better climate for the press and the police to operate, though they have different, they and we have different uh, goals at times, I think that we are hoping for a better climate. I, uh, there is always that concern. But that was, as I've said, a culmination of various administrative of attitudes exacerbated by Washington DC, but also by administrations at City Hall. Maybe at, there will be an election. Maybe there will be a different response from City Hall as well. Uh, Council Member Adams, if, if I could also address that. Um, I, I, sure. mean, I, I think the problem is here, uh, we're in this rulemaking process about suspensions and revocations. 10 years ago, there was another lawsuit and uh, uh, Mr. Siegel will, I'm sure, address that maybe at some point, uh, since I believe he was representing of uh, the people that were involved. And it was a matter of, we redid the credentialing process back then, and we submitted uh, comments on that. So, I mean, if you're looking again at a wholesale uh, revamp of everything from not only the agency, but the application rules, the suspension, revocation, appeals process, uh, I, I think it would be better to wait at least where I think almost there to see what this final rule looks like regarding suspensions and revocations before we kind of undermine the whole process. And then at least the council will have something to work with rather than you know, starting from scratch on, on all of those things. But I certainly understand what you're saying. You know, Our position has been that if you're in a public, traditional public forum, such as on a, on a street uh, covering these, uh, these events, as we saw this summer, you don't need a credential of any kind. Uh, if you're out there covering that. But we saw time and time again where journalists were arrested when they didn't have an NYPD credential. They might have had a credential from the State Department. They might have had no credential. But the bottom line is crossing police and fire lines is one thing. And being out in a public place, just like the protesters and the press, if you recall, was exempt from the curfew. So we're seeing these kinds of things. I know there were questions, were people arrested? And yes, they were, mostly they were photographers. Uh, but, but I was dealing with that and we're still dealing with those kinds of issues. So there's a whole lot of things to be done, but I just think in the administrative process, we really need to let that final rule at least come out so we can see what it looks like. And so the council can see what it looks Great. like if indeed Absolutely. an organization is going to be taking up that and needing some kind of guidelines and template for the rules it's going to develop. 
Yeah, I, I appreciate that, um, Ms. Irving, and, and, and certainly Mickey, and I, I don't necessarily disagree with either of you. Um, again, and I'll just conclude here because my time has expired. The concern with me still is uh, we're talking about climate and, and hoping for the best when it comes to new administration and other things right now. Uh, my concern still stands with uh, the body of the NYPD, which is why we are really uh, pushing for reform. This uh, legislation being a part of that, although we may need to, to look at it a little bit closer with some more input, uh, but the climate itself, we're speaking about uh, administration, federal administration, but in looking at our own NYPD and looking at uh, the fact that the PA system was used in a certain area of this city to promote the former president, um, the fact that the former president's uh, uh, items were, were touted on uniforms of NYPD, uh, the fact that uh, union representatives show up at rallies for the former administration. I'm not too sure that that climate has necessarily changed in the city of New York when it comes to the NYPD. So my concern still stands there. Uh, I'm still willing to, of course, engage in dialogue uh, with all of you that have been in this business far longer than I've been in this New York City Council. So I thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Next, we will hear from Norman Siegel followed by Justin Harrison, and then Robert Roth. Norman Siegel, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time starts now. I believe he's in a frozen mode. Norman, uh, Mr. Siegel, you're on mute right now. Thank you. Uh, the First Amendment provides that government shall not abridge freedom of the press. Clearly free expression by journalists is a fundamental principle of our constitution, an essential element of what makes America unique. The challenge to uphold these basic principles is unfortunately an ongoing struggle. The history of the NYPD and how it exercised authority and jurisdiction over the issuing of press credentials has been unsatisfactory. Transferring the authority to another entity is warranted. For example, in 2009, I and other lawyers filed a federal lawsuit against the city of NYPD to get press credentials for three online journalists and to amend the process and standards for obtaining press credentials. The lawsuit resulted in the recognition that online journalists are entitled to press credentials. Periodically, I received reports that NYPD personnel threatened to pull the press credentials from journalists and photojournalists. One of the themes emerging last summer after the death of George Floyd is to consider transferring many functions from the police to other entities. Issuing press credentials is precisely such a function that needs to be transferred. However, we need to be careful who takes over the job. 2118 gives DCAS sole authority to suspend and revoke press credentials and to issue them. I need to know why DCAS was selected and not, for example, the city's Department of Consumer Protection, which already has authority and jurisdiction over the issuing of numerous city licenses. We also need to closely monitor what the procedure and criteria will be for the applications, suspensions, and revocations. First, the process must be an open process where the public, including journalists, are given notice of an opportunity to comment on the proposed rules prior to its enactment. Second, the standard should not be lawful arrest. It should be lawful conviction. An arrest is, not, is arrest is based on probable cause, not on the guilt of the violation of crime. There are arrests that do not result in conviction. It's also unfair to lump all violations of crimes together. The standard should be lawful conviction of a violation or crime that is related to a journalist's job, activity, or purpose. Third, the standards for suspension and revocation should not be vague and overly broad. Press credential holders need to have a clear notice as to what grounds are for the potential loss of their license. Fourth, we need to consider the more important question, who qualifies as a journalist? Freedom of the press strengthens us as a city and nation. It helps us keep informed and to hold elected and appointed officials, including police officers accountable. Let's continue to respect and support this. The journalists and photojournalists are our eyes and ears. The key is, 
and some people have touched upon it, there's a conflict of interest. The police department issues all of the press credentials. They are the ones who make the complaint that someone's press credentials Sorry. should be removed and they are the judge and jury. That is the conflict of interest. You can't continue this systemic violation. Mr. Siegel, thank you so much for your testimony. One quick question. How do you feel about transferring uh, the responsibilities to the city clerk since it's an independent body from the rest of the city, from the mayor especially? My premise is transfer it out of the NYPD. Second, I don't think it's good to give it to the mayor's office of whatever. I think you need to have an independent agency as the chair is raising. I would look to see whether the clerk has the capacity to do this. My suggestion would be consumer affairs because they issue most of the licenses to people in the city of New York. They have the experience. The decision maker with regard, and Mickey is right, with regard to the standards for the rules and regulations, who determines whether or not the press credential person meets the criteria, who determines whether or not someone should be suspended or their license should be revoked, has to be an independent, interested person. If you don't have that system, we're gonna have these problems over and over again. And when you talk about conflict of interest, it's the access, it's the threats, especially for photojournalists, where they target them and say, we're gonna take your press credential if you don't listen to what we say. It's not just the police and fire lines, as Mickey said, it's out on the street, it's out when there's a protest and a demonstration and a march, and press credential people who have a livelihood are intimidated and chilled under the First Amendment because the threat for someone with a badge will intimidate and chill them and they will accommodate them when they should not. And finally, to Ms. Irving, about your concern, if someone in the police department did not recognize a press credential issued by some city agency, one, that's the responsibility of the mayor and the city council and the police commissioner to educate and train people. And second, if that still doesn't happen, there are people like Mickey and I and others who will go to court to then challenge that process so that we stop that systemic violation of people's rights. Take it away from the NYPD. That is the most important point that you all should be hearing over and over again. Thank you. Committee Council. Thank you, Chair. Uh, next, we will hear from Justin Harrison, followed by Robert Roth, and then Tawaki Kamatsu. Justin Harrison, you may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Your time starts now. Uh, Chairman Cabrera, members of the committee and other panelists, thank you for allowing me to speak here today. Uh, my name is Justin Harrison, and I'm a senior policy counsel with the ACLU of New York. Uh, you have our written remarks. I'm going to keep my uh, statement here short. Um, shifting press credentialing authority from the New York Police Department to an independent agency uh, is essential. It will strengthen journalistic freedom and enhance press protection in New York City at a time when those First Amendment rights have never been more important or, unfortunately, uh, never been under greater attack. Uh, reporting on last year's Black Lives Matter protests and the police treatment of demonstrators all over the country put the rights of Black Americans, the rights of protesters, and the rights of journalists at the forefront of our national debate and have shown how accurate, uh, excuse me, how important it is that journalists be allowed to report truthfully, accurately, and completely on the activities of our police departments. Uh, to do that, we have to give journalists the freedom and the access they need to find and tell the truth and that access should not be regulated by an organization famously resistant to public scrutiny and criticism. If journalistic access is to be regulated at all, it should be regulated by a neutral agency that will grant credentials freely, liberally, and without regard for platform, viewpoint, or agenda, and the rules governing the credentialing process should be clear, open, and easy to follow. Uh, in light of the testimony that I've heard here today, I'd like to add one quick note about background checks. Someone's criminal history should have little to no bearing on their ability to collect and report facts. And the chilling effect of a background check and whatever standardless discretion that might entail 
will only stifle press freedom. A criminal record does not keep someone from entering the Capitol building in Albany or walking into any courthouse in the state and should not keep someone from reporting the news in public spaces. Also, there's been a lot of discussion about whether the entity that controls physical access to police lines, that would be the NYPD, is the correct entity to issue credentials. I respectfully suggest that the two are unrelated. Issuing a set of credentials in advance using a set of standards that are free of bias, agenda, or influence has nothing to do with controlling the physical space in real time uh, for public safety reasons. Um, you know, it is uh, certainly possible that an independent agency be permitted to issue press credentials and that the NYPD still be allowed to secure the scene of a newsworthy event. Uh, that said, we also feel that rules regarding on the street confiscation of press passes should also be clear, easy to follow, and should set a very high standard, a very high standard for when a pass can be confiscated in real time at some newsworthy event. Uh, to sum up, the ACLU of New York believes uh, that transferring press credentialing authority from the NYPD is the right thing to do. Uh, and that some other independent agency, whether it's DCAS uh, or uh, the Office of Consumer Services or some other office, um, is the uh, appropriate move. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Robert Roth, followed by Tawaki Komatsu, and then Joel Kurtzberg. Robert Roth, you may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. Your time starts now. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, members of the committee. My name is Robert Roth, and I have more than 40 years experience as a journalist and as a lawyer. I represent other journalists who hold New York City press cards. And just as a matter of information, Mickey Ostreicher and I are both members of the New York State Bar Association Committee on Media Law, where we serve together, and I chair its subcommittee on New York City News Gathering. While there are some people who would like the issuance of press cards taken away from the NYPD, there is almost no one who wants this to happen without much clearer policies to be delineated than those laid out in the current version of intro 2118. Last August 18th, the NYPD held a hearing on proposed revisions to the rules governing the suspension and revocation of press credentials. The department has not yet published its final version of the new rule, and I would urge this committee to hold off action on intro 2118 until the new rule is published. This will provide the much needed view of both the Corporation Council of, and the mayor on this topic. In the meantime, as requested by the staff of the prime sponsor, I have a few brief points on the bill in its present form. First, as in 1971, when this council took the jurisdiction of taxi cabs away from the NYPD and created a new agency, the Taxi and Limousine Commission, set up a new agency now and staff it with experienced and qualified people to take over the important task of press credentials. Second, mandate under the law that any new credential must be recognized by all city agencies in the same way that the current card is recognized. Third, Provide for the expansion of different types of cards. Bring back the press identification card that was eliminated in 2010. So sports journalists, for example, especially photographers, will have official press identification. And finally, restore the press vehicle cards that went away in 20, 2009. As testimony bore out in the hearing on intro 332, which I worked on with council member Rodriguez, and which was supported by the press club, Jane Tillman Irving testified, the news business should not be the only business that cannot park legally while doing its job. Thank you very much for your consideration. I would be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you. Next, we will hear questions from Council Member Yeager. Time starts now. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Apologize, there was a little unmute issue. Um, uh, first, uh, Mr. Siegel, you know, you and I, you and I are in the same place on the First Amendment. I think uh, 
Uh, we've had these conversations in the past, and uh, uh, I am, you know, I, I keep my little constitution right behind me. Um, uh, used to carry it in my pocket everywhere I go. I just don't really go that many places these days. Um, and and it's the same one I got in law school. Uh, you know, I, Mr. Roth, I, I will tell you that, and I just want to say this for the record, I support uh, number two, number three, number four of your suggestions. Number one, I, I just, I have to say this, um, I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm one of those folks perhaps in the city that, that don't look at the idea of a new city agency as the fix to anything ever. Um, and I don't think that, you know, whether you call it an office or an agency uh, or, or however you frame it, I just don't think that that's the right idea. I do think we have to be in a place where, where the credentialing of press is is uh, uh, unchecked by any uh, uh, outside issues. You know, it can't be that somebody doesn't like a reporter. Uh, it can't be you know predicating it on a background check of some sort that that may bring up information that has nothing to do with whether or not the individual applying is uh, is a bona fide member of the press, a journalist. Uh, you know, somebody who's making this application, and we know this as attorneys. You know, we say. The truth on the application we make the we make the request for example we can obtain the passes to go in and out of courthouses bypass the the detectors why because we're members of the bar we have to make the representation to the um uh, to oca that we are members of the bar we should be entitled to have this card if we are not members of the bar we shouldn't get the card i say this with regard to the press as well if they are bona fide members of the press and doing the reporting they ought to be able to prove that relatively simply. And if so, they should get the card. And the revocation should only be for uh, for non-compliance with the rules uh, and for no other reason. It can't just be because, you know, they uh, their reporting is not OK or or that they got too close to a particular scene at a particular time. But we also have to recognize the fact that to keep order and that's the most important job of a free society is to maintain order that every once in a while it will become necessary to put up barricades and ask people to stand on the other side of the barricades, even the press. It's necessary. Um, and, and I know uh, that, they, that the members of the press corps agree with that. And you know there are, there are people, I'm not gonna call anybody out by name, but there are, there's one person who I recognize on, uh, in this hearing today. Uh, I don't know if he will or won't testify, but I will say that he is somebody who I know has uh, an, an incredible longevity in this city of being able to get that shot. Uh, uh, and maybe we'll hear from him and then I'll say that I was talking about him. Uh, and he does it uh, in incredible ways. And he is, he is a very well-respected uh, member of the press corps. Um, they do it by complying with the rules, but they work hard to do it. Everybody knows that the press works hard to do it. I think we have to come up with that situation, that solution that, that uh, melds public safety with that First Amendment, not right, but obligation of a government to ensure that the First Amendment is being complied with in every single way. And I don't know that this bill does that. I don't know that there's a reason to take it out of the police department uh, for a player to be named later without really knowing what that's going to look like. Uh, one last point to the chair's point about the city clerk maybe being the right entity, I will say that if we have concerns about any entity being answerable to the mayor, the city clerk works for us. He's our appointee. Uh, I don't know that it makes any more sense that the city clerk be the appointee, uh, be, the, be the licensing authority for press credentials if the city clerk works for the city council. Mr. Wolf, go ahead. I'm, I'm a filibuster by nature. Go ahead. Well, thank you, sir. I, first of all, uh, council member Yeager, I must say, uh, you and I are not in disagreement on anything. Uh, I Good. did not. I did not ask. I am not one of the people who asked for the jurisdiction of press credentials to be taken away from the NYPD. I got my first press card in approximately 1980, and uh, you know I have not complained about the system. What my testimony, and, and thank you for allowing me to clarify, it is. If intro 2118 is going to continue on, if there will be a version B, hopefully, a version A, B, whatever, uh, I and, and, and in fact, there will be the, the jurisdiction of press credentials transferred from the NYPD, then I'm saying if this is going to happen, this is what I would like to see, which would be a separate agency. 
because I think that we need to take this out of the mayor's office and we need to have it in an agency where that will be created and staffed by people who have familiarity with how the press works and with how regulations work. Agree. Mr. Chairman, I, I see that Mr. Siegel has his hand up, and if it's if if the chair would be okay with it, uh, and uh, and he'd be all right with Mr. Siegel answering or saying something. Uh, yes, uh, uh, briefly, it. please, because we have people that have been waiting for over two hours, and right, so, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to respect their time. I will be brief. To Councilman Thank Yeager, uh, the respect is two way. Let me make the point: the conflict of interest. The NYPD issues the press credential. It's the police officer out on the street who becomes the complaining party. And then it goes back to the NYPD who becomes the judge and the jury and the decision maker. You can't have a fair system that's set up that way. And second, if you look at the opening of the constitution, justice comes before order. You have to have justice before you have order. I respect you. Your point about the background checks chair, it's in the bill. He's got it right. You can't allow them to open that door for background checks like we had in the 50s. The First Amendment is a neutral principle, applies to everyone, regardless of their ideology and regardless of their past, mis including criminal activity. It's got to be related to the journalist's job, his person, and his activity not some general thing where he was doing something in a bar one evening on his own time. Thank you, Congress, uh, Congressman, uh, City oh. Council Member Yeager. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Powers, for, Pat, for pushing this bill, for Adams and the chair. Push this issue, take it away from the NYPD. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, I wanna clarify for the reason why I brought it up. Uh, not because it was in the bill or not in the bill. I wanted to see, uh, Mr. Siegel, you've been around longer than I have, where there's been times that we ask a question whether a certain practice has been done, right? And then all of a sudden, whoa, we didn't know that that practice was adopted. So now we have it on the books, we have it on the record. And I, and I know you appreciate that as well. Uh, I want Chair. to uh, give it Chair. back to our committee council if there's no other questions uh, for this panelist. Mr. Chair, may I for a moment? Mr. Chair, may, may I for a moment? I think yeah. I, if I may, uh, just a final point on this. And I think there's a way to do what Mr. Siegel is suggesting and also uh, keep the integrity of the system current as it is, is, is without tinkering with the licensure per se, uh, but dealing with the revocation, and, uh, and, and Mr. Siegel's point about the judge jury executioner, um, you know, it's not a quote, it's a paraphrase, uh, being appropriate here. I think that there's a way to remove the adjudication of a removal from the police department and say, put it in an oath, which is universally, I, th I think Mr. Chair, you mentioned that earlier, which is a universally respected uh, court system within our city's uh, charter. Uh, and at the same time, that shouldn't affect the licensing question because recall at the beginning of today's hearing, the police department said that there had been only five uh, suspensions slash revocation. I think this is, they were only suspensions over the last five years. I think those of us who love the first amendment might say that five may be five too many. Um, we don't know the reasons and I'm not here to ask what the reasons are, but I think that to Mr. Siegel's point about uh, the prosecutor not being the jury and not being the judge, uh, maybe transferring the adjudication of revocations to oath and yet still keeping licensure with NYPD might make the most sense. No, Mr. Siegel doesn't like that either, but I'm okay. going to turn it back to the chair. Thank you, uh, council member. Uh, I appreciate it. And I'm sure you'll be having that level of discussion with the prime sponsor of the bill. Uh, uh, committee council, uh, let's uh, let's move with the next panelist. And thank you everyone who's been waiting patiently. Thanks, Chair. Uh, next, we will hear from Tawaki Komatsu, followed by Joel Kurtzberg, and then Jason B. Nicholas. Tawaki Komatsu, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time starts now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Kerbera, um, I previously had a conversation with you where I talked about the fact that you had a public town hall meeting in the Bronx in July of 2017 that the mayor's administration and NYPD security detail illegally kept me out of. 
Um, I currently have roughly 10 federal lawsuits against the city of New York. Question is, we're having this meeting today about press access. Question is, where are the reporters? Who are the reporters? All that I see around me in New York City are censors in journalism. There hasn't been a single story about the litigation I've been involved in against uh, Howard Redmond, the head of the mayor's NYPD security detail. Um, Ms. Castro of the New York City Council, she completed a declaration uh, not too long ago in which she committed perjury in that uh, declaration against me in federal court. So the question again, um, with regards to the First Amendment, the First Amendment does not provide any greater access to information uh, with regards to the press than members of the public. So the question is, instead of having some agency grant access to members of the press for press credentials, why not actually have whistleblowers who consistently have their news censored by alleged members of the press um, control who gets a press credential and who keeps it? So again, this meeting is about First Amendment rights. Um, I've talked to several of you. Um, I'm not going to name names here. But essentially, um, like I said, um, statements have been made during today's hearing are patently false. I can clearly substantiate that. So at the end of the day, there's something called Federal Rule of Civil Procedure Article um, Rule 65, where essentially I can have a federal judge essentially override any determination that you make such that whistleblowers instead of an agency will have full control over who gets a press credential and who keeps it. So you have a decision to make. Um, are you actually going to listen to whistleblowers or are you going to continue to censor them and do nothing about things such that members of the public get uh, terrorized by the NYPD while exercising their First Amendment and 14th Amendment rights in public forums? So I guess qu last question is this, who's going to be the next victim of the NYPD and how many of you are going to talk about that? Have a good day. Thank you. Any questions by our colleagues, our committee council? If not, our next uh, panelists. Yeah, no hands raised. So we'll move to the next panelist. I'd now like to welcome Joel Kurtzberg to testify. After that, I'll be calling on Jason B. Nicholas, followed by Todd Mizell. Joel Kurtzberg, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time starts now. Thank you, council members. Uh, my name is Joel Kurtzberg. I'm a partner at the law firm of Cahill, Gordon, and Ryan Dell. I'm also counsel to photojournalist and journalist Jason Nicholas, who has been referred to not by name today. He happens to be the photojournalist who has the pending litigation against the city that led the city to propose changes to its rules about seizure and um, of press credentials and, and rights of journalists surrounding that. Um, I think that it's important for the council to have some background. I know at one point, council member Yeager asked whether this was a solution in search of a problem or is the current system working and cited the fact that there were only five seizures over the last five years that had been reported. I wanna highlight for the council members what we've learned in the lawsuit that Mr. Nicholas has about why the current system is not working. And we have some issues with the current bill the current bill is problematic because it provides for a change of agency without any promises of um, having what guidance that agency would have for the new rules. That is, we need to make sure that any new rules uh, take into account the due process rights and First Amendment rights of journalists. What we learned about the current system in our litigation is that there were not due process rights for journalists whose credentials were seized. In fact, the city's litigation position to this day is that journalists have no due process rights in this situation. We got a court to say otherwise. But in a, in a nutshell, there are no criteria for when a credential can be seized or when a credential can be suspended. Journalists got no notice of what infraction existed, why it was seized. Um, they had no right to see the evidence against them. When they had a hearing, they asked, we asked to see the evidence against us. We weren't permitted to, we weren't allowed to cross-examine witnesses that were taken into account by the hearing examiners. And there are also First Amendment problems, some of which have been highlighted today. The press has been put in press pens far away from the action so far they can't see. There are many instances where the public has been provided better access to scenes than journalists who have press credentials. 
And uh, there are so many instances, forget about the five where the, the credential is seized, but uh, so many instances where the credential is threatened to be seized. And that is a bigger problem than anything else. Journalists have no recourse when that happens. The problem with the current bill is that it switches to another agency without any promises or guidance to that agency. It just says, send it to rulemaking. Well, if you wanna send it to rulemaking, you need to make clear that the rules have got to have certain due process and first amendment protections in them, whoever drafts them. As a result of our litigation, the police were going to promulgate a new rule, which they have not yet done. And we would advocate that we see what those new rules are before we consider writing a blank check and not knowing whether the new rules would be worse or better for journalists. And just, I know my time is up, but, but Mr. Nicholas also opposes the background check provision that's in the current bill, which I think has been thoroughly repudiated by every member who's spoken so far um, and doesn't seem to have support, but we wanna be on the record as saying it. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Jason B. Nicholas, followed by Todd Mizell, and then Colin DeVries. Jason B. Nicholas, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time starts now. Thank you. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. My name is J.B. Nicholas. In 2015, I filed a lawsuit that resulted in a settlement that reformed the way the NYPD suspends and revokes press credentials. Implementation of the new rules that the settlement requires has been derailed by this bill. Although the city has finalized the rules, it has not published them. I condemn this bill in no uncertain terms. It does not protect the First Amendment, it threatens it. Background checks are tantamount to a licensing scheme that violates the First Amendment. Just as wrong, the bill fails to specify what due process rights and procedures a journalist is entitled to whenever his press credential is suspended or revoked. I spent almost 30 years of my life defending the Constitution, first in prison as a jailhouse lawyer and advocate, then after my parole as a journalist. I fought for and won a five-year legal battle to establish the nation's first prisoner, right, prisoner rights organization. I fought another five-year battle to bring greater fairness to parole hearings in New York. For the last six years, I fought a lawsuit with Joel against the NYPD to reform the way it deals with press. My inspiration for the suit came directly from my experience as a prisoner. We reached a settlement that reforms the system, but this bill derailed its implementation. I urge you to stop this bill dead or entirely change it by eliminating the background check requirement and specifying the procedures to be used whenever by whatever agency has jurisdiction over press credentials. These questions are too important to let an agency decide. The problem is not just the NYPD. In my experience, all administrative agencies can act like the NYPD. No administrative agency can be entrusted to enact regulations that satisfy the Constitution. Unless the council legislates the rights and procedures to be attendant upon the suspension or revocation of credentials, I guarantee you that passing this bill will put me and everyone else fighting with me back to square one without sufficient legal rights to protect the First Amendment. Lastly, I wanna to respond to something I heard during the hearing. Allowing the NYPD to seize credentials, even if they are issued by another agency, will accomplish nothing. The NYPD cannot be allowed to seize credentials. Only the new issuing agencies should be allowed to suspend or revoke credentials through a specific process. Uh, thank you for hearing me. And again, I think a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And if anybody has any questions, I would love to answer them. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Todd Mizell, followed by Colin DeVries, and then El Amin Sumar. Todd Mizell, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time starts now. Hi, uh, I'm Tom Mazel with the Press Photographers. I'm the vice president. I'm in this business 38 years. And I got to tell you, I've experienced what you're talking about many, many times. And I'm still in favor of the uh, press cards being issued by the police department because those cards are scrutinized extensively by the law enforcement and act essentially as a security clearance at scenes of breaking news. 
They are not, nor were they ever intended to be a license to practice journalism. While there are still some significant issues plaguing the process, such as the NYPD's frequently delayed issuing the press cards. By the way, COVID is a poor excuse. And your law enforcement partners, such as MTA, federal, county police, are not informed. We believe the NYPD is still most qualified to distribute the vital document due to those security concerns. We have found, however, that our lines of communications with the Office of Deputy Commissioner of Public Information have been predominantly closed and our repeated efforts at engaging in dialogue with them are ignored up until yesterday. Um, by the way, I don't see any police uh, officials on this call. They, they all left. Uh, we at the NYPP would urge, PPA would urge Commissioner Esposito to keep those lines of communications open. To the issue at hand, we are concerned uh, that allocating the issuance of the press cards to the CAS will degrade the card in the eyes of law enforcement, which will almost certainly lead to complications. Currently, the NYPD has the right to confiscate press cards from holders who allegedly engage in perceived misconduct. Should DCAS issue them, instead it would almost certainly be put to the NYPD in a position of arresting members of the press, rather than simply taking up their card. This would result in a waste of time and resources, particularly as few perceived infractions committed by the members of the press during the course of their work is ever pursued by, by prosecution. The vetting system the NYPD has already in place during theoretically saves countless man hours and resources that would otherwise be spent potentially detaining and litigating the press. Further, what we, the criteria for giving out cards, the NYPB PPA has some serious concerns about stringency of the issuance of press cards and extension, DCAS ability to vet the cards. Should DCAS be the distributor of press cards, it would give the NYPD valid reasons to refuse to honor them. The truth of the matter is, is NYPD has more sophisticated vetting system than possibly any other state agency, let alone the city itself. Perhaps most important criteria for distribution of cards, we at the NYPPA have some serious questions about what the new criteria would be for revoking a card. Um, we haven't heard anything from the NYPD. They right. haven't put anything out. Um, we acknowledge there is a problem with the NYPD, but those issues come down to one oversight. While some things certainly need attention by the council and the mayor, and the difficulties with the NYPD can be corrected with more open communications. The NYPD press card was created over a century ago solely as an instrument to help journalists access the scenes of emergencies, not as a permit to report the news. However, the credential is honored by other agencies and organizations as a valid, ready, form of identification. Again, we believe the NYPD should issue cards and that they should be obligated to treat all members of the media equally, eliminate the conflicts of interest that would currently plague the industry. And most of all, that they make a good faith effort to respond to our requests to address problems. We hope to continue to work with Deputy Commissioner Richard Esposito and his staff on these matters in the future. We are hopeful that our upcoming meeting with the Deputy Commissioner, the first since he's took office, will result in better working relationship. We thank the council. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Colin DeVries, followed by El Amin Sumar, and then Craig Ruddle. Colin DeVries, you may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. Your time starts now. Dear council members, I've worked as a reporter and newspaper editor in New York City and upstate New York, uh, previously as managing editor for the Times Ledger Weekly Newspaper Group in Queens, and as a digital editor at the New York Daily News. I'm president of the Deadline Club, which has hundreds of members as the New York City chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. The club has been in existence since 1925 and has dedicated itself to the perpetuation of a free press as the cornerstone of our nation and our liberty. In August 2020, the Board of Governors of the Deadline Club vehemently vehemently opposed efforts by the New York Police Department to make it easier for press credentials to be suspended or revoked. The First Amendment safeguards the right to freedom of, a pre of, of speech and the press and fundamental liberties in a free government. I'm aware of at least a handful of documented cases of journalists being harassed, arrested, 
or assaulted by police in New York City over the past year. There are likely others that have gone undocumented. I'm happy to share those links with you, or you can find them yourself using pressfreedomtracker.us. Whether the NYPD or another agency issues the press card, I can see both sides of that argument, uh, though I tend to side with Mr. Siegel's comments. Uh, but I do believe those freelance journalists and reporters who do not cover police or breaking news events should have an opportunity to share their concerns and experiences. At times, simply covering a meeting, a court hearing, or a political event might require an NYPD-issued press credential, which a journalist who doesn't regularly cover breaking news or what the NYPD defines as a, quote, covered event, unquote, might not be able to obtain. Additionally, under the new proposal, 2118, there is some language I find troubling, including the addition of background checks. What about a person's background would make them ineligible for a press credential? Would that apply to a single event pass or all types of proposed passes? More broadly, would we then be inadvertently imposing a standard of access for the press in New York City? There remains too many unanswered questions that present opportunities for confusion, misinterpretation, and abuse which could then ultimately lead to a more restricted press, a limited First Amendment, and a less informed public. I would suggest the formation of a task force, including members of the press associations represented here and others, to better study and make recommendations on the press credentialing process. That would make the process more inclusive and result in a stronger press credentialing process without limiting press freedom. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we will hear questions from Councilmember Powers. Hi there. Um, thank you for that. I, I just wanted. I just wanted to add. I, I was going to do this earlier, and I just wanted to add some clarification on just the, the question about the background checks in here, which is we, we, the intention here is not to do. Um, background checks here, and you know, I, I think, and I think, you know, I, it's, it's not my intention here. I know, I know, I, I, I'm reading the bill here as well, but um, you know, I do think I, I do recognize and understand the concerns with that, and um, we're talking, and we'll, we'll we'll talk to folks at, offline about about that. But I I do want to be clear here that I do not want to create new obstacles for folks to be able to get a press press credential here in the city of New York. And I, I don't, you know, know that we need to subject people to a background check in order to do that. So we will want to clarify that. And second, on the recommendation that I've seen some folks had, had also made online and also I think was just made, we want to work with the folks that are um, uh, are um, uh, in, the, in the industry, in the field on these issues. We want uh, to solicit them. I've met with some folks so far. We will meet with more. To hear those insights, and I just want to clear so so and to make a process that works for everyone, and recognizes the concerns. We're not trying to thrust this upon anybody. We do want to work with folks. So I just want to clarify that just to, just so it's on the record for this hearing, on both of those accounts. And we will be happy to meet with anybody that have we've not had a chance to meet with yet to talk more about their issues or concerns. So thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from El Amin Sumar, followed by Craig Ruddle. Oh, I mean, Sumar, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time starts now. Thank you. And uh, I was going to say good morning, but I think good afternoon now, Chair Cabrera and members of the council. My name is Alamine Sumar. I am counsel at the New York Times Company. Uh, and I just want to speak very briefly on two points. Uh, the first is that, um, you know, whatever the intentions of this bill, it's premature. Um, there's a valid question been raised about whether press credentialing should be housed within the NYPD or within another agency, but that's not a question that has to be answered today. Uh, as Mr. Osterreicher, Mr. Roth, and Mr. Kurtzberg pointed out, there is an NYPD rulemaking on this issue ongoing. That rule hasn't been published yet. We should wait for that to happen before council takes any further steps. So we can assess whether you know there is merit to changing the system to moving press credentialing to another agency. So we should wait for that to play out before doing anything. Uh, the second point is just um, you know, in the alternative, if council is determined to press ahead with this bill, 
uh, it should at a minimum, as others have said, contain very strict rules about the issuance, suspension, and revocation of press credentials. And there should be no circumstance in which an NYPD officer for any reason should be permitted to summarily suspend uh, a reporter's credentials on the street. If a reporter commits an infraction, violates the rules, that can be taken up at another time. Uh, that's all I have to say, happy to take questions. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Craig Ruddle. Craig Ruddle, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time starts now. Hi, <clears throat> pardon me. I haven't talked for a while. Thanks for having me. Um, I just wanted to mentioned a couple of things. So uh, I've actually been working for about 41 years as a photojournalist. Uh, I've, I've been a staff photographer. I've been a freelance photographer. And for the last 14 years or so, I've been here back in New York after leaving from an earlier time. And um, so my experience on the street has been, I started out like many of us, we get our press credential, we're out on the street and it's this instrument that we use to get recognized at a, at a scene. <clears throat> Pardon me about that. And so that what I have seen in the last, uh, probably specifically the last few years, it seems like that credential, as proud as I am to have it, it seems to be at times an impediment. Um, I can tell you that I'm sort of sharing anecdotes with you. There's a lot of other conversation here about the process about this bill. So this is mostly anecdotal and I'm speaking for myself. I'm not representing everyone here. My relationship with DCPI, who we deal with on the street, is, is good, and I'm proud of that as well. But the fact is, often this press credential is, it can actually work against us. Um, and it's recognized immediately by officers on the street. And sometimes I think those officers see it, and they see us coming from yards, and if not dozens of yards away, and they, and they will see us coming. And the first thing they say is, you need to go over there, or you can't stand there. Um, and so the credential system to a degree is broken is, as far as I'm concerned. In a way, maybe it doesn't represent the conflict that Norman speaks of, but to, in a way it is a conflict in that it's almost become a marker. Sometimes people literally tuck it into their jacket. Um, and I think that one of the frustrations that we've had with this press credential, and I'll, I'll give you a, a recent example was covering the New Year's Eve, um, the, the New Year's Eve activities. And this specifically, I wish I had more time, but I'm gonna talk about the mayor's office. I believe MOM or Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment issued the permits for the activities on Times Square, which obviously let the network set up, it let the events happen. Matter of fact, the Key and Mortar Corporation literally took over an entire block of Times Square. But when it came to the press access, even during the times of COVID, you will find that a couple of hundred of us got jammed into a press pen. There's no possible way we were meeting any sort of COVID regulations or, or recommendations. So the, the, again, the issue, the press pass itself end, ended up becoming a bit of an, uh, a detriment to perhaps our safety. I mean, I'm certainly willing to go. I was glad I was there, but I found it really ironic that we at that point were sort of in, in the worst position when it came to our our, uh, our press pass and its use. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear questions from Councilmember Powers. Thank you, and I'm sorry uh, to keep interviewing. I just want to go back to the gentleman from the New York Times because I had my hand up, but I didn't get a chance oh. to, um, to, to ask him a question, so I apologize. Absolutely. Can... Absolutely. Um, thank you for that um, testimony. I, 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 I just wanted to ask, like, what, your editorial board has editorialized on this and in fact, I think took a different opinion than I think the testimony you're offering. And I think in fact, when I had tweeted out that I was introduced, so, uh, you know, considering doing the legislation had um, uh, done an editorial in support of it that you know basically so we should consider more seriously this proposal to move the credentials elsewhere um i don't of course believe the editorial board has to agree with everyone else in the 
uh, in the New York Times. In fact, I don't I don't want that. But uh, but but um, I want I want everybody to have to be able to form their own opinions as they desire and report on it. But you know, and anything to offer that? I mean, it just seems like your editorial board has done so has supported that and has said they think that this is a a worthwhile uh, proposal uh, for us to consider moving it in order to preserve the freedom of the press. And I just would be curious to hear if you had any thing to say with regard to that. Yeah, thanks, uh, Council Member Powers. I want to be clear that I'm, I'm not talking about the substance of the bill, other than to say that it should contain more guidance on issuance, suspension, and revocation of credentials. Uh, I'm certainly not walking away from what the editorial board said in July. Um, and in fact, from the comments that we submitted to the NYPD in advance of the hearing on August 18th. Uh, and the comments were to the effect of the editorial that we have serious problems with a system in which the NYPD can summarily suspend a reporter's press credentials on the street before there has been any kind of process. Um, so I'm not here to say that the substance of the bill or the, just the general idea that press credentials should be housed elsewhere uh, is a bad one. Uh, all I'm saying is that the NYPD rulemaking should be allowed to play out. Uh, and whatever the result of that rulemaking, it may not be one that the Times likes, it may not be one that others on this call likes, but at least gives us a reference point and something to compare this to and say, well, what are the ways in which the current system is deficient and can be improved? So uh, I, I really don't want to kind of malign your intentions and know that they're good. And I'm certainly not walking away from what the editorial board said. It's a, it's a matter more of procedure than substance, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think we can do both at the same time for, for frankly, I have a conversation about moving it and as we await it, but, but I, I hear you. I just was curious to hear. Yeah, and, and I think the, the ongoing discussions are a great idea and very welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the chair. Thank you. Um, we've heard from all of our registered witnesses. So at this time, if you have not been called and you wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no hands raised, I'll now turn it back to Chair Cabrera for closing remarks. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the staff that made uh, this hearing possible. I wanna thank all the panelists that were here today. I really appreciate all of the different points of view. I was pleasantly surprised uh, to hear uh, from the press uh, how there are diverse point of views regarding uh, this uh, bill. Uh, we're gonna be looking at it very closely, working with the uh, prime sponsor of this bill, Councilmember Powell's. I wanna thank uh, also my colleagues uh, that stayed all the way through uh, of this hearing. And with that, we conclude today.